Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Justin Peters. I hope that you and your family are doing well today. I want to thank you very much for watching this video. By now, most, if not all of you, have heard of the arrest of Pastor James Coates. James is the pastor of Grace Life Church in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And James was arrested this past Tuesday as of this recording, but this past Tuesday, February the 16th of 2021, and he was arrested simply for the high crime of leading his church in doing what the church is supposed to do, what the church is commanded to do by her head, Jesus Christ. And that is to gather together as a local body of believers, gather together for the purpose of worshiping God and having fellowship with one another. And for for that crime, James has been arrested. And uh, to as to my best understanding, he is even in a maximum security prison, if you can believe that. Uh, just a little bit of background story here. In early 2020, Grace Life Church of Edmonton, or just outside of Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, uh, closed its doors. They closed their doors, as did the vast majority of churches around the world because at that point there was a lot of uncertainty about just how serious COVID-19 was going to be and um, all the health officials and the in the local state and federal government um, had told all the churches that you've got to close and, and initially it was for just about all businesses that were not deemed essential of course church is essential but um, we'll get to that in a minute but um, Grace Life Church shut down, uh, as did nearly all the churches. Uh, but then as the weeks and months went on, it became pretty obvious pretty quickly that COVID-19 was really not going to be all that serious for the vast majority of people. It, it had, and still does, have a survival rate of upwards of 98%. In fact, I would surmise that the survival rate is actually far higher than that because I think the vast majority, or great majority anyway, of people who have had COVID-19, their cases have not even been reported. Uh, I think there's been a lot more people who just never went to the hospital. But anyway, that's, a, that's another discussion. But safe to say that uh, the great, great, great majority of people survive COVID-19. Granted, it can be fatal. In fact, uh, just a few days ago, uh, as of this recording, a few days ago, Fred Price, one of the w more well-known Word of Faith preachers, um, faith healers, prosperity preachers, died of COVID-19. But he was he was uh, 89 years old, and, um, and and he died from it. So yes, it it can end up in a fatality for people who are who are very advanced in years and they have some other underlying health issues yes it, it can be serious but the, for the vast majority of people it really doesn't seem to be much if any more dangerous than than the common flu that we have every single year so as as time went on this became pretty obvious and um, in fact what we were seeing is that the effects of the lockdown were turning out to be far more serious than the effects of the virus itself. Uh, and so Grace Life Church, beginning in June of 2020, did exactly what they should do and uh, what other churches began to do. They began to reopen, uh, open back up and uh, meet together. And so they did this and they began to meet together again for corporate worship fellowship with one another. But in December, Alberta's chief medical officer issued a mandate that uh, for all of the churches in Alberta, Canada, uh, all of them had to restrict the size of their uh, worship gatherings on Sunday to 15% capacity, 15%. You know, assuming a church has uh, just about a full sanctuary, of course, what about the other 85% of people? What about them? They're apparently gonna, gonna be excluded from doing what Christ has commanded them to do. And so you've got just 15% or so of your of your body there. And and so that's not real worship. This is this is a restriction on the churches and um, Grace Life Church just continued to do church 
the way they had been doing it since June. Well, this got uh, the, the powers that be really upset. And so uh, health officials were beginning to come to the services there at Grace Life and take notes. Uh, they came with uh, pen and paper or smart device or whatever, and uh, they were basically spying on the church, looking around, seeing seeing who had masks on, how many people had masks, uh, how many didn't, because the, the restrictions were not only just the 15%, but everybody had to have a mask, and you had to do social distancing. Um, you had to be at least six feet apart from uh, the next worshiper, I suppose family groups could could sit together, but uh, they had to be separated, and and so I've I've seen this, I've seen this in a, in a lot of churches myself, and uh, so that's what was going on. They were spying on the, they were spying on the church, and so they they were taking back their reports and reported it uh, to the health department, and on December the seventeenth, I believe it was, the report was submitted. And on January 29th, uh, the the local government there or provincial government uh, issued a mandate that uh, Grace Life Church had to close, had to close completely. This despite there not having been a single COVID case in that congregation for at least half a year. But the church met anyway, and on February the 7th, Sunday, February the 7th, police officers came to Grace Life Church to arrest Pastor James. And uh, James explained to the police officers why he was doing what he was doing. He has a command from Scripture. This is religious freedom, after all. But he had a command from Scripture to meet and to shepherd his flock. And uh, the police officers left, apparently, without even arresting him, even though that was the uh, purpose for which they had come. But they left without arresting him. Well, Sundays tend to roll around pretty regularly, and so the next Sunday came, Sunday, February 14th. The church meets again, and James preaches a fantastic sermon from Romans chapter 13. Uh, talking about being in submission to the governing authorities. He preached that sermon, and I'm about to play that sermon for you because you really, really need to hear this message. He preached that sermon knowing full well that it was going to mean his arrest. They had already come for him the Sunday before, and for whatever reason they decided to to uh, not arrest him, but um, but he knew if he had church again, they undoubtedly would do it the next time, and and so uh, and so they did. I, I think my best understanding, he preached that Sunday knowing that he was going to be arrested for what he was doing, and yet he did it anyway, because this is what a faithful shepherd does. He shepherds his flock. He preached the word of God on Sunday, February fourteenth cared for his flock. And then two days later, Tuesday the 16th, according to the report that I read online from a Canadian news source, he turned himself in. He, he was The police didn't have to come and get him. He turned himself in. And despite going to the police station himself, turning himself in, they still put him in handcuffs and leg shackles. Leg shackles are for people to, to, to prevent prisoners from trying to escape if there is reason to suspect that they would do so if they had the opportunity. He obviously was not going to do that. He turned himself in, and yet they still put him in leg shackles. And I have no doubt that that was to simply to make a statement. And so in a prison cell, Pastor James sits. As I understand it, he is actually in a maximum security prison now, along with rapists and murderers. That's where he is, this pastor, this shepherd. And he has been offered his freedom. The Canadian government has told him, you can have your freedom if you will just promise not to step foot inside Grace Life Church again. But Pastor James cannot do that. He could be reunited right now with his wife, Erin, and their two sons. But Pastor James understands Luke 14, 26. He understands what that really means. 
He understands the gravity of the responsibility that has been given to him by God to shepherd that flock. And so he must obey God rather than man. And so in a prison cell, he sits. I want to read to you uh, some excerpts from from his wife, Erin, and some of the things that she has posted on social media. And uh, this was posted just the day after her husband was arrested. Erin says this, Saints, I can't even begin to express my gratitude for the outpouring of love. I've been flooded with messages, and it pains me that I cannot respond to them all. I want to know each one of you and how our dear Lord has worked in your life. Thank you for your kindness in our darkest hour. My heart is shattered, yet rejoicing. We knew this could cost us, and I would do it a thousand times over for our King in the hearts entrusted to us at Grace Life Church. Her health and progress in the gospel is our top priority. Yesterday was the hardest day of my life. I want to address a secret part of my comment from yesterday. Our lawyer was zoomed in with James in trial yesterday. The courthouse and the officers were the ones who would not tell us where he was. The inhumanity of my husband in chains, while I could not find or get to him, broke me. To think he stood alone when we were trying to get to him was almost too much for me until I remembered the one who loves him more than I ever could was standing with him. I must trust James' life to him. He is only good to us. I was able to speak with James yesterday, again trying to get to him, but they wouldn't let us see each other. He is in quarantine in a medium security. I believe it's maximum security now. I cannot visit because of the virus restrictions. He will be isolated for two weeks or, Lord willing, his release. I do not know when I will speak to him next. In God's goodness, he has his Bible, the sweetest treasure he knows he has been able to carry with him. You all keep asking, what can you do? The Lord has so faithfully provided for our physical needs. Our lawyer is pro bono, so if you desire to send a donation, please consider the JCCF. What is something tangible you can do? Open your churches. Open your churches. Worship Christ. Practice the one another's. Sing your hearts out. Let your pastor see your eyes as he preaches the word of God to you. Don't underestimate this task in your life. Obey Christ with all you have. Proclaim his excellencies through this. Use this as conversations for those who do not know Christ and let the Spirit do a work we have never seen. Please keep praying for us. My children are broken yet resolved. Pray for James. Isolation can break the strongest of men. Aaron, if you happen to be watching this, I would say your husband is a very, very strong man. And I know that he loves you, and I know that he loves the boys, your sons. Um, I am so sorry. I am so sorry that this is happening to y'all. My wife, Kathy, is just... Uh, she just told me a few minutes ago that, that you and your family are all she can think about right now and what you're going through. We're so very sorry. But at the same time, what an encouragement the witness of your husband, James, is. What an encouragement and what a rebuke uh, to so many of us. Uh, I, I so admire him and so grateful for the witness that he is showing the world right now. Praise God for that. So that was Erin from a few days ago, and I want to read to you what she wrote just today. Again, this is Saturday, February the 20th. So uh, just today, Erin wrote this. She says, I want to answer some questions I'm getting to bring some clarity. I'll do a few of these. Please understand that information is always moving and changing. Many people, when they give me information, have put it through their own grid. I know now why the Lord made James a man of precision. And, dear friends, let me tell you, when when you hear a sermon here in just a little bit uh, from Romans 13, precision. From this point on, James will be my main source of information. I was able to speak to him last night. I'll try to be as transparent as I can with the information. Number one, James' condition. James could be a free man. He could walk at any point. All he would have to do is capitulate on what he believes is his duty before God 
and what love requires of him towards Grace Life Church. Just bend his conviction and override his conscience. That's it. James told me last night the crown said that he can walk if he agrees to not hold services as he has been doing. If he does not, the conditions currently in place prevent James from preaching, leading worship, and even setting foot inside Grace Life Church until the time of his trial, which is yet to be determined. What is our public health order? 15% capacity. And she said this is about one-fifth to one-sixth of our congregation. So, you know, from all the other folks, too bad. Um, She says we don't have a large building. This would mean no visitors, no outreach, no being a light to this city, mandatory masks, social distancing, no singing, no conversing with anyone outside of your home. Live stream is available, but you are not allowed to have anyone into your home. These restrictions hinder James from being able to converse with the people of Grace Life Church on a Sunday as they immediately have to leave the service. We are prohibited from practicing the one another's in the gathering or in person at all. These have been in place since early December. Alberta has had two extreme lockdowns but has, but has had restrictions on the gathering for almost a year. He could not sign these conditions. I love him for this. Amen. Amen. This is, this is a man of conviction. This is a man who actually believes that he will one day give an account for the souls that he is shepherding. He actually believes that. All of us as ministers, as uh, preachers, pastors, and I'm not a pastor, I'm, I'm an evangelist, but uh, all of us in the ministry would, would say intellectually, oh yeah, well, yeah, yeah, we're going to have to give an account for one day for all the, the people we've taught. And, and I, I, I really wonder a lot of times how many of us actually believe it. James Coates does. Aaron continues, Was James chained? James was hand and ankle cuffed at his hearing and transferred to the RCMP. I don't know if he was still chained when he was brought to the jail. His words to me when he called me at the RCMP were, Honey, they shackled me. Is James getting food and water? And I, I think this is this is kind of humorous in parentheses. She says, I'm guessing this question is coming from countries that have dungeons for prisons. <laughs> in the last video I posted, you can see the facility. James is receiving food and water, three meals a day, portioned meals like all the others. This will be an adjustment for someone who has an athletic build and fast metabolism. He told me last night he had lost some weight and was hungry. Again, this is natural. Is he still in chains? He is not in cuffs currently. He is in quarantine for two weeks and has about one hour out of his cell a day for exercise. One hour out of his cell. And he's basically he's in solitary confinement, as I understand it. One hour out of his cell with the murderers and the rapists and the child molesters right where he belongs, right? She says, you can't see him. Uh, She says, I cannot visit him because of COVID. After his quarantine, he is allowed video calls every two days for half an hour. He has one hour out of his cell where he can call me, shower, and do whatever else he needs to do. How incredibly heartbreaking. I cannot imagine what this dear sister in the Lord is going through. I cannot imagine what James is going through. I cannot imagine what their sons are going through. I I just can't. Um, How utterly heartbreaking and yet how encouraging to see this man take a stand and, and do what he knows he is mandated to do from God's Word. Um, a tremendous encouragement. And the flip side, sadly, of that encouragement is that um, I have been greatly discouraged 
by a lot of the comments that I have seen from a lot of professing Christians. You know, this, this, whole, uh, this whole social justice issue has been quite revealing in the last several years because it is it is really uh, it's been a it's been quite the dividing line and as i've watched this unfold in just the last week or so it really seems to uh whether you're supportive of pastor james and what he has done or not supportive it really does seem pretty much to fall along which side of the social just justice issue you have decided to plant your flag and um, I, I want to read to you just a, a couple of the comments that I've seen. And one of them, this is from Jacob Den Hollander. And uh, Jacob Den Hollander says this. He says, I'm not saying I agree or disagree with Coates' imprisonment. I lean towards thinking it's quite excessive. However, that's not the same thing as thinking this represents a troubling slide towards specific uh, towards specifically religious persecution. So he, he says he leans towards thinking it's it's excessive, but he but for him to for for him to actually say I I'm not saying I agree or disagree with his imprisonment. What? You can't say whether you agree or disagree with it. My word, this is just I I, I don't understand that kind of thinking. I really, truly do not understand that kind of thinking. And, and as, as discouraging as that was, um, I, I probably the, the one that takes the cake for me, at least the ones I've seen, and I, I guess I should count myself blessed that I, I haven't seen nearly as much of this as, uh, as I probably could have. But um, Mike Hovland was, uh, was an elder there at Grace Life Church, the same church that Pastor James is pastoring. Uh, he was an elder there, and he uh, he is now pastoring kind of a like a church plant from this church, uh, and um, uh, and I know some of the pe- folks in that church actually. I, I preached. This is in Lacrete, Alberta, Canada, and I preached in Lacrete, and I, I know some of the some of these uh, brothers and sisters that are in this church plant. But uh, anyway, Mike Covlin uh, said this. He tweeted. He said. John Bunyan was imprisoned for 12 years for not complying with the government regulations imposed on religious gatherings. He could have left at any time if he agreed to comply. He said, if you release me today, I will preach tomorrow. That's what John Bunyan said. And, uh, and that's exactly what the situation is with James Coates. I mean, the, the, the nature of the persecution is, is different, granted. Uh, at least the, the the specific reasons, but nonetheless, um, John Bunyan could have had his freedom if he would just agree not to preach. Pastor James could have his freedom if he would just agree not to preach, as we just read from from his wife's statements. Uh, and, and Aaron Harding, Aaron Harding uh, is fully woke. And uh, some of the things I've seen from her are just just appalling. But she responded to Mike Coughlin, and I want you to see what she said. She said, just so we are clear, James Coates is literally not in jail for preaching. He is allowed to preach. Everyone in the whole country has to follow health mandates. He isn't the special snowflake. Stop this false narrative. Snowflake? Really? Snowflake, huh? This is a man who is sitting in solitary confinement in a maximum security prison because he must obey God rather than man. He is without, he is apart from his family. His wife is without her husband. His sons are without their father. Honey, they shackled me. And you call him a snowflake? Shame on you. Shame on you. And shame on anyone who would disparage this brother in Christ. Shame on you. 
A little bit earlier tonight, I spoke with one of the brothers that I know up there in La Crete, Alberta, Canada, and um, he's part of this church plant. That's his church. And uh, I was up in La Crete, Alberta, several years ago, uh, preaching, and he's one of the one of the brothers that I met. He and his family, a dear family. But anyway, I, I called him up tonight to just to discuss some of this, and and uh, Robin told me that some of the prisons there in Canada have actually released a number of prisoners because they had COVID. And some of these were violent criminals. I mean, crim- criminals that had been arrested for some, for some very violent things. And they were released because they had COVID. And here sits Pastor James, who does not have COVID. No one in his church has COVID and hasn't had COVID for at least half a year or more. And um, here he sits in prison. And Robin told me that the restaurants in Alberta, Canada, I don't know about the the entire country, but I know in Alberta, uh, the restaurants are at full capacity. There there is no limit. If a restaurant can fill every table, they're allowed to do so right now. They're allowed to do so. Full capacity. No, not 15% capacity. No, full capacity in the restaurants. Not with churches. Not with churches. And you're going to tell me that this isn't persecution? Of course it is. Of course it's persecution. But, you know, Pastor James is just a snowflake. Okay. This brings me to the sermon that Pastor James Coates preached on Sunday, February 14th from Romans chapter 13. And this is the text that deals with us as Christians being in submission to the governing authorities? Is there a limit to what the government can tell us uh, that we we can and cannot do within the confines of a worship service? And the answer to that question is an unequivocal yes. There are limits, and there is a time when we as believers uh, are to practice civil disobedience to the governing authorities if the government oversteps its bounds. You see, dear friends, all authority belongs to God, right? I think we should all be able to agree upon that. All authority belongs to God. And so any authority that any other individual or any other institution exercises is authority that has been delegated to it by God. And God is not going to delegate authority to any other person or any other institution that is in contradiction with his own decreed will. And we know God's decreed will for us as Christians to worship because his word tells us what his decreed will is. His decreed will for worship is that we are to do it. We are to gather together as saints, as brothers and sisters in Christ. We are to gather together and we are to worship Christ We are to hear the word of God preached. We are to encourage one another, have fellowship with one another. This is what we do. This is what the Bible tells us to do. And so anytime the government steps into the realm of the church and says, you can't do this, you you must limit your gatherings to 15% capacity, and you cannot sing because of COVID, the government has overstepped its bounds. It is exercising authority that has not been given to it by God because God is not going to delegate authority that contradicts his word. And um, that's just, I'm, I'm going to leave it there and I, I want you to listen. I want you to listen to this sermon from James Coates on Romans 13 uh, because a lot of Christians have um, a, a very unbalanced and very unhealthy and I would say a, a, an unbiblical view of just what the government can and cannot do when it comes to um, telling us what we can and cannot do when it comes to worship. And the government has no jurisdiction in the church. It has no jurisdiction in the church. So please listen to this sermon. Listen to it carefully. Listen to it repeatedly. Take notes. I encourage you to do that. It is a, it's a superb sermon and all the more meaningful knowing that brother james was preaching this knowing 
that it was going to be, in all likelihood, the last time he preached from that pulpit for who knows how long. And so that it makes it all the more meaningful. And uh, what an encouragement this is going to be for you, and what a rebuke that uh, this will also be to so many people who think that the government has a right to tell us what we can and cannot do within the local body. So without any further delay, Pastor James Coates. Well, thank you so much, Joe and team, for leading us in song this morning so faithfully and powerfully. It is a rich, rich joy and pleasure to bring to you the Word of God this morning. And obviously, we've been in John chapter 10, working through John's gospel. And there's a portion at the end of John 10 that we still haven't yet covered, but as I anticipated this moment, I, I felt something else was needed, and I wasn't entirely sure what that was, but as the week progressed, it began to kind of crystallize, and here we are. So we're going to be a little bit off the map today, not in John, and I've got a bit of an introduction here to kind of set the table a little bit. I think we can say this, that this particular time in history has exposed some deficiencies in the broader evangelical church. For one, it's exposed a deficient ecclesiology. Ecclesiology is the study of the doctrines of the church and encompasses everything from what the church is to the essential elements of worship. And what's apparent, at least to me, is that the church today has a very low ecclesiology. Where a virtual church is not only fine, it's a wonderful evolution of things. And related to that is, too, a deficient approach to Scripture. That unless Scripture explicitly states certain things, there's total freedom on how we fulfill its commands. And so... Unless scripture states, quote, thou shalt meet on Sunday in one gathering, in person, ensuring that all interaction takes place within six feet of the other person, without a mask, and with some kind of physical expression of affection, whether it be a hug or a handshake, end quote, we're off the hook. And it typically goes like this. Scripture doesn't explicitly say... And this is coming from pastors, from the overseers of the corporate gathering. Scripture doesn't explicitly say. And so the government isn't commanding us to sin, and therefore we must obey. And what that reveals is a deficient approach to Scripture. And ironically, it might even betray a legalistic approach to scripture, that unless scripture explicitly says something, I'm under no obligation to do it. So why is that deficient? Because it fails to recognize that the God intended implications of a passage are binding. It doesn't have to be explicitly said. As students of Scripture, we're under obligation to heed its implications, and that requires a much more careful and thoughtful reading of Scripture. You see, it's too much to ask that Scripture would speak explicitly to our current situation. Now, it does speak to our current situation, both implicitly and explicitly. But given the unique setting we find ourselves in, much is addressed by way of implication. And that requires, again, an intensely careful and thoughtful reading of Scripture. Third, I believe our circumstances have exposed a deficient theology of persecution. We seem to have an incredibly narrow and historically ignorant view of what persecution actually is. 
We seem to think persecution is only persecution when it's directed exclusively at the church. And that unless the church is being persecuted, it must obey government. Now, developing a, a robust theology of persecution is beyond the scope of what I intend to do today. But I think we need to understand that persecution often results from doing what the state forbids. That obedience to Christ is the catalyst for persecution. And so you don't wait to be persecuted to obey Christ. It's your, it's your obedience to Christ that results in persecution. You see, some give the impression that if we were being persecuted, then only then would it be right for us to gather, which is a strange position, especially since all you need to do is, is, is obey the government, comply with government to avoid persecution. If you comply with the government, you may never be persecuted. And really, what that does to say that that only if we're being persecuted are we to gather as we currently are, you're basically saying that it's right to gather. Implicitly, you're saying it's right to gather. That, that according to the word of God, if, if persecution were on the church, then we would have an obligation to gather. So you're admitting that it's right to gather. I think that's amazing. Because now, if you say, well, we're not going to gather because we're not being persecuted, you're not doing that out of biblical conviction at this point in time. You're doing that out of some kind of pragmatism. To, to uphold your, your testimony in the world, which I hope isn't seeking the approval of men or avoiding the disapproval of men. But let me just say this. Whether or not we're being persecuted makes absolutely no difference to me. I don't think that I could care any less about whether or not this meets the definition of persecution. That doesn't even factor into the equation for me. That's not the basis upon which I'm doing anything. I'm doing what I'm doing in obedience to Christ. I am quite content to let the Lord Jesus Christ himself decide whether or not this is persecution. He promises that those who are persecuted for his namesake will be blessed. He's the one that blesses, and I'm content to leave that in his court. My responsibility is to obey, is to obey Christ, correct? Amen. Amen. Doesn't matter whether this is persecution or not. That's irrelevant. Irrelevant. Doesn't even factor into the equation. And connected to this deficient theology of persecution, I believe is a deficient knowledge of history both church and secular. We are awful historians, myself included. And that makes us incredibly susceptible to deception, both theological and political. Why do you think they want to rewrite history? Why do you think they want to change the curriculum in schools to make us stupid? To make us more gullible, that we'll fail to see what's really happening, fail to be able to see what's, what's really taking place in this day. And so we need to become better historians. You as a congregation need to get into history. You need to start reading history, one book at a time, exposing yourself to what has taken place centuries past to equip yourself for the present. But the deficiency that I want to address today relates to the role of government. The historical time we're in has revealed both a deficient and inaccurate theology of government. And it's deficient for at least two reasons. One, we've simply had it so good for so long. We've simply had it so good for so long and therefore haven't had to think deeply about this aspect of theology. It's a muscle we just simply haven't worked. And two, as I've already said, we're ignorant of historical theology because theologians of the past thought deeply about these things and we haven't significantly enough and sufficiently enough exposed ourselves to their writing. And so to begin a conversation today that seeks to address this deficiency, I want to turn to Romans 13. Only, I want to look at it from a different vantage point. 
You see, instead of focusing primarily on our response to government, I want to focus on the government's God-given duty. What is the God-ordained role of government? And can we even ask that question? And so there's a sense in which this sermon is addressed to the government. The government needs to be informed of its God-ordained purpose. And if we, the church, don't inform them, who will? We are the pillar and support of the truth. We are the, the priests of God to mediate his word to this earth, this world. And therefore, we have a responsibility of informing the government of their God-given duty. And so we'll certainly touch on aspects of our response to government, but the main goal is to highlight the God-ordained role of government. And so, if you would, open your Bible to Romans 13, if you haven't already, and let's go ahead and read verses 1 to 7. We're going to be only looking at verses 1 to 4, but let's read verses 1 to 7. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by him. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. And so the goal of our time is to further develop our theology of government to assist us in navigating our ever-changing world and, Lord willing, to even inform the government of its God-ordained role. And so if you're taking notes, jot down first the source of governmental authority. The source of governmental authority. This comes out in verse 1. Look at it. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. Now, what does it mean to be in subjection? Just briefly, it means that we're to arrange ourselves under the governing authorities, to be submissive to them. Now, does submission demand obedience? Typically, yes. But it's important to note, Paul doesn't write, every person must be obedient to the governing authorities. There's certainly overlap between submissiveness and obedience, but obedience almost demands more. And obedience doesn't take into account that there are times when we simply cannot obey the government. And scripturally speaking, we know there are times when we can't obey the government. For example, there's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel 3, who refused to bow the knee to the golden image. And we have the examples of the apostles that we just read about this morning who declared we must obey God rather than men. And so then, is it possible to be submissively, or rather simultaneously submissive and disobedient to the government at the same time? Can you be submissive to government while simultaneously practicing civil disobedience all at the same time? And the answer is yes, we absolutely can. We can practice civil disobedience while maintaining a submissive posture. You say, how? By humbly subjecting ourselves to the consequences of our civil disobedience. Look, we recognize we're not the government, but we have a responsibility to Christ. And when that responsibility leads us into conflict with the government, we have to bear up under that conflict. Graciously, humbly, submissively, but nevertheless, we have to bear up under it. They have the right before God to do whatever they believe is right. They will be held accountable for that. And when they act unjustly, God will settle the score at the end of the day. But nevertheless, we can absolutely practice civil disobedience while maintaining a submissive posture. How do we do that? By entrusting ourselves to him who judges righteously, 1 Peter 2, 23. 
And it's important to note that practicing civil disobedience in one area doesn't mean practicing civil disobedience in every area. And so it's only at a particular point that civil disobedience would need to be practiced. And so how do we decide when civil disobedience is necessary? How do we decide when civil disobedience is necessary? Well, let me give you three categories. These are helpful. One, when the government forbids what God commands. When the government forbids what God commands. For example, forbidding the preaching of his word. Can't comply with that. Two, when the government commands what God forbids. When the government commands what God forbids. For example, commanding worship of a golden image. Can't comply with that. And three, when the government commands what isn't theirs to command, critical, when the government commands what isn't theirs to command, for example, the terms of worship for a local church, can't comply with that, not their jurisdiction. They have no, no jurisdiction at this juncture. So we cannot comply with that. Three categories that call for civil disobedience. But all of that, of course, is geared toward our response to the government. And we want to home in on the God-ordained role of government. And so we're going to do that in the next part of verse 1, where the reason for being subject to the governing authorities is given. Look at it, next part of verse 1. For there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are, which exist are established by God. So the reason we're to be subject to the governing authorities is because all authority is from God. That means all authority originates with God, which means all authority is delegated authority. And that means the governing authorities are accountable to who? To God. In other words, the governing authorities have a stewardship from God for which they will be judged. They are not autonomous. They are not sovereign. They are servants of God, verse 5. Deacons of God. And servants are always accountable to their masters. And so what must they do to faithfully discharge their duty? They must govern by the standard by which they will be judged. They must govern by the standard by which they will be judged, which is what? The word of God. They're going to be judged by the word of God. They're accountable to God. And therefore, they must govern in accord with the word of God. Now, how many governments actually know they're accountable to God? Do you think our government knows it's accountable to God? Not likely. And if it does, it is suppressing the truth and unrighteousness, Romans 1.18. And whose role is it to inform them? I've already said it. Whose role is it to inform the government of its God-given responsibility or to call them to repentance? It's the church. Why? Because we've been entrusted with the revelation that spells all this out. In fact, if the church refuses to fulfill this role and function, then it's walking in negligence. A negligence that's incredibly unloving. Why? Why? Because those who are walking in governmental misconduct are actually storing up wrath for themselves for the day of judgment by not informing the government of its God-ordained role and not pointing out when the government is out of step with that role and by not pointing out that they are actually governing unjustly, we are not loving the government. These are individuals, human beings who are accountable to God, who need to be confronted with their sin in order to realize they need to be reconciled to God through the Son, Jesus Christ. You see, complying with unbiblical and unjust government laws is neither faithful nor loving. Affirming the government has an authority it doesn't actually have is neither faithful nor loving. It doesn't demonstrate true love for those in authority. It doesn't demonstrate true love for our neighbor. It doesn't demonstrate true love for the church. It doesn't demonstrate true love primarily for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
The church of all institutions has this obligation to call the government to its God-ordained duty. Now, how do we do that? And this is where things get a little more difficult because there are many benign ways to call government to its duty. You can write your MLA. You can write your premier. Maybe a little less benign, you can do an open letter that gets some visibility. And there are more confrontational ways. For example, you can take them to court and enter into a legal dispute with them. But you can also do what we're doing. By meeting, we're testifying the government has no jurisdiction here, not with regard to our worship. And so by simply being open and by garnering the attention we have, which is not our choice, but it has come, we're showing the government they've overstepped their authority. Regardless of whether their excuse is a so-called pandemic or not. And so by obeying Christ in this way, the government is being forced to consider what their authority actually is. And it's facilitating opportunities like this to testify against it. Now, it's important to understand that as we look at what we're doing as a local church, it's obedience to Christ that's driving this. It's theology that's driving this. It's ecclesiology that's driving this. Jesus is the head of the church. He is the supreme authority over the church, and he governs his church by his word. And our responsibility is to ensure that his word governs the church. But by doing what we're doing, we are also loving our neighbor. And that too obeys Christ. And in addition, we are loving our government because we are testifying that it's out of step with its God-given role. And that too is obedience to Christ. You see, what this season really does, and I think you'll see this as we keep going this morning, is it, it broadens the picture. You want to compartmentalize spiritual life and what it means to follow Christ and pull that back out of the public place, the public sphere, and live your personal walk with Jesus Christ all by yourself? You can't do that and be faithful. This is our Father's world. We're here as salt and light. We're his representatives on the earth. Just for the record, by the way, the media continues to talk about faith leaders. I haven't got the foggiest idea what a faith leader is. Please, I am not a faith leader. I am an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am a herald of the King of Kings. I am here with a message from heaven. I am not a faith leader, whatever that is. I didn't intend to say that, but nevertheless. <laughs> so listen, it's theological in the context of ecclesiology. It's theological in the context of loving our neighbor. It's, it's theological in the context of holding government accountable. All of it is bound up in the word of God, the whole thing. Now, I have to admit that historically, I haven't been very politically involved. I've voted I've certainly preached the word, which has unavoidable political implications since the word addresses biblical morality. But that's about it. And so you might be going, well, James, what's changed? I mean, you seem to have changed your position on this whole matter of your involvement in quote-unquote politics. Well, for one, I've got to evaluate whether or not I've been negligent. It's possible that I've been negligent, that I have not been fulfilling my God-given responsibility. I've got to evaluate that. I've got to consider that. But here's the fundamental difference. For the first time in my ministry, the government is reaching into the life of the church. That's my domain. That's the domain of the elders here at Grace Life Church. That's the Lord Jesus Christ's domain. Attempting to dictate to us the terms of worship is not 
the government's jurisdiction, and I refuse to give the government what isn't theirs. Caesar has no jurisdiction here. So by recognizing that God is the source of governmental authority, things begin to open up a bit. Government is accountable to God and will be judged by him and will be judged in accordance with God's word. And since we've been entrusted with his word, we have a unique responsibility whereby we must call government to its God-ordained duty. And doing so can not only be done while maintaining a submissive posture, it's among the most loving things we can do. That's the source of governmental authority. Second, if you're taking notes, jot this down, the limits of governmental authority. The limits of governmental authority. Look at verse 2. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. So here's the logic, verses 1 and 2. Everyone is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. This is due to the fact that government authority finds its source in God, and therefore, everyone who resists this authority opposes the ordinance of God and will receive earthly condemnation from the government. But there are some questions that need to be asked at this point. For example... Is all resistance to the governing authorities opposition to the ordinance of God? Is all resistance to the governing authorities opposition to the ordinance of God? We would have to say no. See the apostles. See Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We understand that. But how about this? Is every government law an ordinance of God? Is every government law an ordinance of God. We would have to say no. Otherwise, when government orders an evil, unjust law, God would be ordering evil. So no, when the government orders an unjust law, it is not an ordinance of God. God does not order unjust laws. Or in a similar way, this. Do all government laws come with the authority of God? Do all government laws come with the authority of God? Again, we would have to say what? No. Since their authority is delegated to them, their laws must be consistent with the law of God. Right? Or how about this? When the government says we can't meet as we always have, does it come with the authority of God? When the government says we can't meet as we always have, does it come with the authority of God? Are we opposing the ordinance of God? If you say we are, then you're essentially pitting God against God. That God is currently contradicting himself. And I realize at that point you might say, but this is a pandemic. So these are extenuating circumstances. And if you said that, you would be wrong on two fronts. One, it isn't a pandemic. And two, you have a deficient theology of government. You don't understand the role and function of government. And I want to see if I can address that. And this is going to dovetail with what we'll see next. And what we'll see next is the purpose of governmental authority. But the the limits and purpose of government authority go hand in hand. The God-ordained purpose of something limits it. And therefore, we're going to see in a moment, the government has a particular lane. And to begin this discussion, I want you to turn to Genesis 1. Genesis chapter 1. Verses 26 and following. This describes the overarching kingdom mandate given to mankind at creation. And this transcends every legal document that governs a land. So this, is, this, is, this transcends the charter. And in fact, I would say this, that the Constitution, I think, according to its founders, sought to actually uphold what we're going to see right now. Genesis 1, verse 26 and following. Then God said, familiar passage, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them, note this, rule 
over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God creates man to rule over the creation. Verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Verse 28, God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So God gives to man the unique responsibility to exercise dominion over the earth, to rule and subdue the earth. What this is, is an inalienable right given by God to man. It's an undeniable right, and by right I mean authority. God has given to man the authority to rule and subdue the earth. And that comes with certain freedoms. The right to life, that is the right to live the life that God has given to you, up until he takes it away. The right to work. Yes, in giving to man the responsibility to rule over the earth, Work is a fundamental, inalienable right. Man, the Bible says you don't work, you don't eat. Work is a, a right given to man by God, the right to have a family, the right to be with your family, the right to be with your family when they're dying. That is a God-given right, an inalienable right, the right to acquire property, to possess property, to own that property. That's part of ruling and, 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 and subduing the earth. It's part of exercising dominion over the earth. Now to do that effectively, what is absolutely critical? If man is going to rule over the earth and exercise dominion and carry out his, his, uh, his inalienable God-given rights, what does he need? Especially in a fallen world. He needs government. Why? Government is in place to protect those inalienable rights. The purpose of government is to facilitate mankind exercising dominion over the earth. The government is fundamentally there to make sure that we can fulfill our mission to subdue the earth, to work, to worship, to to be fruitful and multiply. The government is a God-ordained institution put in place to ensure law and order and to protect these God-given rights or this God-given authority. And so government is actually vital to man fulfilling this mission, especially in a fallen world. Now, one of the earliest times, if not the earliest time, that government is implied is in Genesis 9. So turn there. And it's implied in relationship to murder. Genesis 9, 6. The consequence for murder is put forth. And that implies government because someone would need to enforce the consequence for committing murder. Genesis 9, 6. Whoever sheds man's blood by man, and we could assume by way of implication, government... His blood shall be shed, for in the image of God, he made man. So as clearly, or as early as as, as Genesis 9, we have, by way of implication, a clear reference to government. The death penalty is set forth in Genesis 9. Now, fundamentally, what is that protecting? If government is to institute, exercise, implement the death penalty against someone who commits murder, what does that protect? See, you might be thinking, well, it protects life. Well, it does, but not the one who was murdered. The one who was murdered is already dead. So it's not protecting them. But it does does 
provide a, a law that is to prevent and restrain murder from taking place. And so it's not primarily protecting life. What's it protecting? Rights. The right to live. Another human being does not have the right to take the rights of another individual through murder. See, this is really critical. If you believe government has the responsibility to protect life, then you are like buttoning up a shirt with the, the, you know, the wrong button and you're going to get the whole thing wrong. Government's responsibility is to protect rights of which life is only one. But it's a package deal. They have a responsibility of upholding all of the inalienable rights given to man by God. Again, the death penalty functions to prevent murder, which in turn protects a person's God-given right to life, at least until God takes it away. So again, this is critical to understanding the limits and purpose of government. Man is made in God's image. God has given to man the authority to exercise dominion over the earth, and this invests him with certain inalienable rights to accomplish that end. And to facilitate this, God puts in place government and its responsibility is to protect these, these inalienable rights so that man can accomplish his mission. In order that, it would be a minister of God to you for your good, Romans 13. Right? If government does its job to ensure that your God-given rights are protected, are you not going to delight in government? If government facilitates you fulfilling your mission in life, in exercising dominion over the earth through, through employment and, and provision for your family and having a family and all the rest of it, are you not going to love and delight in government? Of course you are. Government doesn't grant these rights. Instead, government is obligated by God to recognize these rights. Government does not impart these things. They're already ours by God. Government must recognize them. Now that sets clear limits on government authority. Because when government begins to get in the way of man accomplishing his God-given mission, it is no longer functioning as God intended. Instead of that, it's facili- instead, of, instead, of, instead of functioning that way, it's failing to facilitate the kingdom mandate that we have and is oppressing it. And what that does is it sets the table for the purpose of government. And really to critique whether or not government lockdowns are consistent with the God-ordained role and function of government. So if you're taking notes, jot down third, the purpose of government. The purpose of government. Look at verse 3 of Romans 13, back in Romans 13 now. It says, therefore, rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do, what, um, do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same, for it, is not, for it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. So as we would expect, the purpose of government, based on what we just saw, is to praise good behavior and avenge evil. What's the obvious question? Who gets to determine what's good and what's evil? Whose prerogative is that? Who defines good and evil? And the answer should be obvious, both from Romans 13.1 and what we just saw in Genesis, God does. God determines what is good and what is evil, and he does that by his word. You see, even if you take the Ten Commandments alone, the second half of the Ten Commandments, it's easy to see how they relate to the kingdom mandate. You shall not murder, which touches what? The right to life. You shall not commit adultery, which touches what? The right to family. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, which can expose them to liabilities and even death. You shall not steal which protects a person's property and possessions. And that Paul has these things in mind is evident in verse 8 and following. Look at it. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. 
For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. As Paul is setting forth Romans 13 and the call to submit to government and even dealing with the issue of good and evil, he has the law of God in mind. And so good and evil aren't defined by the ever-evolving whims of culture. Good and evil are defined by God. And that reinforces the obligation of government to govern in accord with God's will. Again, an obligation for which they will be judged. And so the limits and purpose of government are clear and unmistakable. The role of government is to protect the undeniable rights given to man in the garden, and it fulfills this purpose by upholding law and order, punishing evil, and getting out of the way. Amen? So with that, let's place government lockdown measures under the microscope of God's word. Question. Is it the government's responsibility to protect us from a virus? Is it the government's responsibility to protect us from a virus? Many want to say yes, believing it's their responsibility to protect life, but but that's not the government's responsibility. Especially given the fact that doing so actually infringes on undeniable God-given rights, like the right to work the right to worship. Again, the right to be with your family when they're dying. In some cases, the right to life. I would love to be wrong on this, but with good, credible information, if an individual in the hospital right now undergoes a cardiac arrest, a nurse must put on full PPE prior to administering CPR. So someone is having a heart attack and they got to put on full PPE before they minister CPR to that person. In some cases, the right to life. And you might think, but, but what about war? I mean, isn't the government to protect life in the context of war? And, and if it is... Doesn't that make the protection of life fundamental to its responsibility? But even then, the government's responsibility in the context of war is to protect rights of which life is one. War ought to take place to protect inalienable rights. See World War II, for example. And so to this question, is the government's responsibility to protect us from a virus? No, we live in a fallen world. Viruses are inevitable in a fallen world. And it isn't the government's responsibility to protect us from a virus. What's their responsibility to protect our God-given rights? In fact, when you listen to our government, as they talk about these lockdown measures, they talk about trying to balance the infringement on our civil liberties with the harms stemming from the lockdowns. That's pretty significant. Our government acknowledges publicly that there are harms that are a result of the lockdown measures. Let's let that sink in for a little bit. Now, if they are trying to balance our civil liberties against the the harms stemming from lockdown measures, they are out of their God-ordained lane. They They are stepping into a lane that is not theirs. In effect, they are seeking to play the role of God. Why? Because implicitly, they're deciding who gets to suffer. And what's its justification for doing so? That our health system could, could become stressed, might become overwhelmed. Can't say will because it hasn't happened yet. And there's no guarantee 
that it will, could become overwhelmed, might become stressed. And again, what's amazing is that our government actually acknowledges the harms of lockdown measures. They recognize there are harms resulting from their actions. And I want you to feel the weight of this. Is the virus the government's fault? No, to our knowledge, our government has no responsibility, no culpability with regard to the presence of the virus. And so if someone should die from COVID-19, is the government culpable? No. We live in a fallen world. Viruses and death are inevitable. A virus is unleashed on the world. God is sovereign over that virus. The effects of that virus are not the government's responsibility. They do not have the responsibility to protect us from the virus. There's no culpability when someone dies from COVID-19. But what if someone dies as a result of government lockdown measures? Is there culpability then before God? I would say there is. Why? Because they're out of their God-ordained role. They're no longer functioning in accordance with their God-intended purpose. And therefore, the harms that result from their actions actually fall to them as their responsibility, where they're going to have to give an account for those harms to God. That's significant. We're just talking about Alberta right now. Broaden it to the whole world, where most of the governments of this world are in lockstep in the way they're handling this so-called pandemic. And so what should the government have done at the beginning? Should have equipped Albertans with the best information they have and protect their in alienable rights to work, to worship, to be with family, to live. The risk of the virus falls to who? The individual. The individual gets to assume their level of risk with regard to the virus, not the government. It's not their role. It's not their function. It's not why God put them there. You say, well, what if the healthcare system ended up actually being overwhelmed? Well, look, that's incredibly difficult. That, that is no doubt a crisis. That, that is something surely to, to look at soberly and consider soberly. But God is sovereign. And government needs to stay in its God-ordained lane. And they're not going to like this answer. But you trust the Lord... And you do everything you possibly can to meet the need when it arises. You take other steps to, to account for that possibility while still protecting the, the, the God-given rights of mankind. And, and that might even require leaning on the general public to get involved in the healthcare system, to serve their neighbors in the event that, that things got stressed. Look, I'm willing to get in there. If our hospitals are going to go and burst the seams, I'll get involved. I'll serve our neighbors. I'll put myself in the, in the line of fire on that. Wouldn't you? That is a much more humane, honorable, glorious solution for mankind to really come together should we get to that point. Instead of this false sentimentality where we're all in this together now. Now, let's say you're the premier. And taking that approach is political suicide. What do you do? I mean, you survey it. If you are aware of your God-ordained role and function, and you go, if I do that, I'm going to commit political suicide. What do you do? you die a political death. You have a responsibility before God and to the people of Alberta who have elected you to put your foot down and stand 
and protect their God-given rights. That's what you need to do. Now, there are examples of this, this kind of governance. You ever heard of Governor Christy Noem, South Dakota? She would be a breath of fresh air for you. I like to call her a rock star. I'm saying Christy Noem for presidency 2024. <laughs> hey, if you can't find a man who's cour- courageous enough to, to take the helm appropriately and rightly, then I'll take a woman. Give me Christy Noem. I'm going to get myself in trouble here. (laughs) Now, it's interesting. Our our premier just recently wanted to talk about the death rate and how the death rate is greater in South Dakota than it is in in Alberta. Jason Kenney's responsibility isn't to govern the death rate. He's not responsible for the death rate. That's not his responsibility. God is responsible for the death rate. He's responsible to to protect our God-given, God-ordained, inalienable rights. And so what does this mean for government? Our government needs to repent. Our government needs to repent. If there are believers in our government, they need to repent And they need to begin to stand up for what's right. Believers everywhere need to start standing for righteousness and and calling the people above them to the right standard, even calling them to repentance. And those who don't know Christ in government, they need to turn from their sin and believe on him. They are storing up wrath for themselves for the day of judgment. There is a judgment coming. And it will be unleashed with the full fury of God's wrath. And those who are in government right now have a responsibility, a a, a heightened accountability. They have a God-ordained function. They are a minister of God. And they are going to be held accountable for the way they carry that out. And if they do not repent of the way that they are currently conducting themselves, it is not going to go well for them. And it's not too late. It's not too late. Put the politics aside. Forget about what's happened to this point in time. Deal honestly with the situation. I would just appeal to the government. God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger. If you would just confess your sin, acknowledge that you've come short of his glory, look to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who went to the cross and suffered under the wrath of God for all who would ever believe on his name. If they would just understand that God is merciful, that he says, come, let us reason together that if they would understand that God is gracious and merciful, that they would come unto Christ and be forgiven and cleansed and washed. The whole record of any guilt against them totally taken out of the way, then they're given a new heart, born from above, and they have everything they need to stand for righteousness and begin to appeal to those who are with them, above them, to do the right thing. What about law enforcement? Law enforcement needs to stand for righteousness. Law enforcement needs to say to their, that the people above them, no, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not going to write that ticket. No, I'm not going to arrest that pastor. No, I'm not going to put that person in jail. They have that responsibility. They need to do that. And by the way, they're out there. We've been reached out to by RCMP and other provinces already. There are men that are willing to stand. There are men that are in the RCMP that are trying to get their comrades to see things differently, to wake up and smell the roses. We've got an Edmonton police service officer in the building right now, in this congregation. Law enforcement needs to say no. Needs to do the right thing. Needs to take a stand.
Well, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, for those of you tuning in online, we had a gentleman just stand and uh, just express that at this point in time, though he was once a peace officer, he no longer is. And um, that, um, that officers at present are currently violating the law by doing some of the things they're doing. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. You know, one of the challenges here is um, many of our neighbors, I mean, we can see it online this past week, for example, many of our neighbors uh, hate us, you know, want us dead, um, want us locked up. And I would just say this, that I'm putting my life on the line and I'm doing that even for those who hate me. There are people in our precious province who can't stand me and want me dead. And I'm willing to put my neck on the line for them. And I would hope that God might use that in some way to reach them for Christ. Because what I'm doing here is, is a, a minuscule fraction of what Christ did for me when he died for me while I yet hated him, while I was yet a sinner, while I was in hostility to him. And so I would just say this to the public of Alberta, if you hate me, that's okay. I'm gonna put my neck on the line believing that I'm doing the best thing I possibly can for you, regardless of what you think about it. And that's loving my neighbor, which is exactly what the word of God commands me to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. let's try and bring this home. The source of government authority is from God. The governing authorities are accountable to God and God will hold them accountable in accordance with his word. There are limits on government authority. And that's because government authority has a particular purpose, a role and function that goes all the way back to the garden where government is in place to uphold and protect our inalienable rights given to us by God. And therefore, the government at present needs to cease with its attempt to mitigate the spread of the virus through lockdown measures and begin to protect the rights and freedoms of the people of this province. And more importantly than that, and what I would want even more than that, is that they would come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, if you're here today, I need to proclaim to you the good news. And the good news is only good news because there's bad news. The bad news is you were born in sin. You came into this world dead in trespasses and sins. Your heart came into this world hostile to God, hostile to his righteousness, hostile to his son. Truth be told, you hate God coming into this world. And if you are outside of Christ, then you hate God now. Your indifference, if that's where you're at, is hatred toward God. It's hostility toward God. You are being indifferent to your creator, the one who gives you right now life and breath. And so what God did, here's the good news, he sent his son to take upon himself human flesh, to live a life under the law of God, the the law of his father. And he obeyed that law in every respect. He was tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. And in obedience to the Father, not only did he live a perfect life, he went to the cross to offer himself as a sacrifice for sin. But you need to understand, it wasn't the crucifixion. It wasn't the the physical suffering that made atonement for sin. That wasn't the issue. That was horrific enough. It was that the Father treated the Son on the cross as though the son had committed the sin of all who would ever believe in his name. The perfect, eternal, unblemished, obedient son was treated on that cross as though he were guilty of the sin of everyone for whom he died. After accomplishing that, he gave up his last breath on his own authority, went into the grave, and on his own authority rose from the grave, came to life and is now seated at the right hand of God. And now the proclamation 
the message of Christ given to you this day by an ambassador of Christ is that if you would turn from your sin, if you would turn from your sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, if you would come to Christ, if you would enter through the door that is Christ, if you would enter through the narrow gate, you will be saved. You will be imputed with the righteousness of Christ. That means you will be clothed with his righteousness, given a perfect record of righteousness to stand before God, holy and blameless. You'll be given eternal life where you will begin even now to experience the life of God in your inner man as you're being transformed into the image of Christ. And that life will just carry you into eternity when you die in this, and leave this body and enter life to come. And you will have hope everlasting, joy everlasting. You will be in the presence and glory of the Savior for all of eternity, which, by the way, is not merely a, a spiritual existence. It is a physical reality, new heavens, new earth, new glorified bodies fit for eternity, where you're going to get to work and, and, and have relationship and worship freely, exercising all of your God-given rights in honor and glory to him. And so if you don't know him, believe on him this day. Receive the Savior and be saved. Let's pray. Well, Father, we just commit this all into your hands. We thank you for the privilege that you've given to us to be here this day. Father, we thank you for what you have given us by way of responsibility, what you have given us by way of obligation, even in calling the world to repentance, our government to repentance. And Father, we pray that if it be pleasing in your sight, and if this proclamation be faithful to your word, that you would allow it to go forth and bear fruit and accomplish a great work both in this province and this nation. So Father, we give you the glory. We're here as willing servants. We trust you and we entrust ourselves to you. For you are great and there is none greater. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.